Also in Blender 2.66 is a lot of cycles improvements, and the most prominent of these is hair strand rendering support in cycles. So for those of you that are ever working with particle hair strands and want to be able to render them in cycles, now you can. And one of the benefits to this is just due to the nature of the way cycles works, it's now much, much easier to get realistic results with hair strand rendering in cycles. If you've ever used the hair strands in the Blender internal, then you probably know that it can be very, very challenging to get good results with good render times. Um, you would have to do a lot of tweaking with the actual lighting, working with shadow buffers, and just tweaking a whole bunch of different settings to get a really nice result. Well, now in Cycles, it's just really straightforward and really easy. So first thing to note, though, is say if I have my, my hair strand rendering here, if I just have a simple cube that then has had uh, particles uh, um, added to it, and then I've just set some very basic hair dynamics, let's first of all look at how to enable hair rendering in the first place. Because hair rendering is technically an experimental feature where it's added in cycles, but it's experimental, so it's not, com it's not fully complete. There's still some feature like core features that need to be added to it but it's usable and is ready to go for the most part. So you just need to set your feature set over to experimental. And then once you add in your particle system, you'll find cycles hair rendering and cycles hair setting right down here. So you just need to enable cycles hair rendering and then your render, it will just work. And it's really quick, it's easy and very well, easy to use. So first of all, if we just take a look at our node view, we can take a look at how it works. A uh, nice thing about hair strand rendering is that it, they basically are, take any other shader. So hair strands are actual objects, essentially, that are generated at render time. So you can use glossy shaders, you can use diffuse shaders, you can use any shader you want on your hair, and it works just like any other cycles objects but then we have the ability to customize some things. So first of all, you can change the mode for your hair rendering between smooth curves, accurate, true normal, tangent normal, fast planes, and custom. Now I recommend you check out the documentation in this case. So you go over to the cycles release notes and then inside hair strand rendering, you can find the hair rendering documentation. In here, you'll find all the details then on exactly what each of the different settings do from the primitives to using you know the different methods such as tangent normal etc i'm not going to go into that because most likely i would probably uh, lead you astray and try and describe something that really i had no idea what i was talking about so instead i recommend that you just read through this and then that'll give you a pretty good idea uh, but with these i will say that basically each one smooth curves is going to be your most accurate and highest quality but it's also going to take the longest to render. Whereas then it's something like fast planes is going to be really, really fast, but it's not going to give you nearly the quality. And just for comparison sake, I've loaded in three images here, three renders. And this one here, you can kind of see, looks pretty nice. This is this image here, just rendered with a single area lamp. And this is my smooth curves preset. And it took two minutes and 21 seconds to render. Uh, I was rendering these on an iMac, I think a quad core 2.83 or something like that. Fairly decent machine, uh, nothing crazy. It was all CPU rendering, which is another thing I should note. Currently, as, as the hair rendering is still in development, it doesn't yet support GPU rendering. So it only runs on a CPU. GPU rendering is planned and will definitely be added in the future. It's just not there quite yet. Uh, so like here, you can see a comparison. Here's the smooth curves. And then if we go down to the true normal, you can see it looks pretty similar. Although the true normal, uh, for some reason, it rendered in less than half the time. So, you know, the first one was two, two minutes and 20 seconds. This one was 51 seconds. And like really, really similar. Although this one got a lot of fireflies in it. These could, of course, be removed pretty easily, but they're there. Whereas the smooth curves uh, had no fireflies whatsoever. And then lastly, I did a fast planes and you can see it rendered in even just 36 seconds, but it's also much darker. And so I would need to work with the shader a lot more, work with the lighting in order to get that to render exactly the same. But, you know, just go ahead and play with those a lot to see what works best. If in doubt, if you want quality and you don't care about render time, then use the smooth curves. So on the, the cycle settings, we also have the, the shape here. So real quick, I'm just going to turn my children down to say... We'll just do 10, so it's really low, and we'll set this down. To, actually, you know what? Why don't we even just do 1, so it's really low, and then I'm going to go in and render this so you can actually see the hair strands right here. And first, let's just go in. Let's look at if we change the shape. The shape basically defines whether or not the hair is shaped like this or is shaped 
like this. And so if you're doing like short fur or something like that, you would probably want to use a shape of positive one. And so you can see it basically just fades out really, really quickly or negative one. So those are the maximums in each direction. Then it goes all the way out and gives you kind of like a cylindrical hair within a smooth tip. Now the closed tip depend, depend or defines whether or not the, the tip radius is zero or not. So if you close the tip, you're always going to have a tip basically like this is going to close off and just be, you know, completely closed and tiny. If you don't use the closed tip, then your hair is technically hollow at the tip and you may see it. Now, I don't know if this has any effect on render time. Probably it does, but just be aware of what it does. Next, we also have the root multiplier. So this is the size of the hair. So if we set this all the way up to one, you can see we've got these really long, big hairs. And you can see right now as fast planes, they're really, they literally are just basically extruded planes that then are mimicking the shape. Whereas if I turn these over to smooth curves, you can see they're actually curves and give me a much nicer, like cylindrical item. So, you know, these are going to have really nice shading and highlights and things like that. Whereas the fast planes are going to be just that. So they're, that's why they, you're not seeing nearly the depth in them because they're not getting the, the variation of the highlights and shadows. It's just basically one flat surface that then is getting shaded. Whereas then like things like accurate and true normal, you can see accurate is like segmented curves. True normal is kind of the same thing. I don't actually know the difference between these. Again, I recommend you read the, the release notes for the full details. Uh, but for the time being, just for demo sakes, we're going to stick on smooth curves. So I can adjust the root multiplier and then the tip. If I don't close the tip, you'll notice here we go. Then they're actually just hollow tubes. And then this tip multiplier, if we set this to say like 0.01, or let's see if we set this, I don't remember which way this goes. Um, you can adjust the tip size, but you know, you just kind of have to play with it to see what it does. It doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot. Uh, so for the time being, I'm just going to leave it at zero. Most of the time you're going to be working with a closed tip, assuming that you're doing hair or something like that. Next, we have a couple of things in here. So first of all, we have a new hair info node, which you can find via input and hair info. And this just gives you access to a couple of things. First of all, let me make these a little bit more extreme. We're going to make th this green and this red or pink. There we go. So right now, this right now, this color is just being mixed based on the intercept. And what the intercept is, is the length along the curve. So if this is my hair strand and this is the root and this is the tip, then over here is going to be green and here is going to be pink. And so if we then just take this off, you can see it's just going to mix between the two. If I set it to is strand, and let me just real quick underneath my render setting, set this, we're going to set this one to be hair and set this to one. Okay, here we go. So now my render emitter should render with the same setting or the same material as the actual strands. So we'll go back into render mode. Now you can't really see it right now but my emitter should actually be, be green. So you can basically say is strand is, Hey, is there a strand? If it's a strand, give it this color here. If it's not a strand, give it this color here. The intercept again is then the length along the strand. And so this way you can do like a base of green. In fact, let me just go in here in the children so that you can see this a little easier. We're just going to set this to none and the number of particles. Let's take this down to 200. There we go. So now you can actually see this. So you can see that this is green and then it's starting green here with this intercept. You can go in and you can add in, say a converter and a color ramp, drop that right in there and then just use this to pull it up. So I can make just the tips really green, or I can go the other way around like this. You know, you can do all kinds of things to then adjust that. That's basically just a, you know, black to black to white along the length of the strand. The thickness then is you can adjust it where you know, the thinner or the thicker the strand gets, then the, that defines the color that you, it receives. If we tweak this up, you should be able to see it. Now I don't, I haven't really used the thickness much, so this may not, ah, there we go. So if we bring this up, basically the thicker the strand, then the more color it's going to receive, or, you know, depending on which one you get. And then the tangent normal is used for things like anastropic shading and things like that. Again, I don't have an example of that one because I haven't dug into it enough yet. Most of the time you're going to be using either is strand or intercept if at all. So, you know, this is particularly good. Like, for example, like if, you know, if you're doing a, a woman that has dyed hair or something like that and 
uh, maybe the, the hair has grown out a little bit, then the roots of her hair are going to be a slightly different color, you know, either darker or lighter or something like that than the rest of the hair. And so you could use the, the intercept along with a color gradient to then control that. Or if, again, if you want to say, just set the tips to a different color for, you know, bleach tips or something, you know, some, something like that, then you can do that really easily just by using the intercept with a color ramp like this. So there's all kinds of different things that you can do with that. Or if you wanted to say, like if you're doing grass and you wanted to add a little bit of brown to the very, very tip of the grass, then you could do it with this very quick and very easy. So that's hair strand rendering support in cycles. It's really nice. It's really quick and really, really easy to set up. Uh, next thing we've got, let me just open another file here is OSL improvements. So OSL is open shading language, and I'm not going to give you too much of a demo here because I don't uh, personally know OSL. I'm not really able to do much in it, but basically OSL is open shading language or it's the scripting language that allows you to write your own custom shaders for cycles and even exchange those shaders with other render engines that also use OSL. Um, I know that uh, V-Ray has OSL support um, in development. I think Arnold has OSL support and there's a couple others that are working on it. And so, you know, we're going to be able to exchange shaders between software very, very easily. So in this case, we've had a couple of new shaders added. Number one is a diffuse ramp. So now you can access from your code right here. Uh, and again, I can't really break down this code for you because, again, I don't really know it, but I can do just kind of a basic example showing you what it is. Basically, now you can call out in your code the diffuse tune BSDF such that then you can get something like this where you can have a ramp shader based on all your different colors. Oops, this is the wrong one. Diffuse ramp. There we go. So you can have all your different colors right here and through here to then set it. So here I've just gone from basically a, you know, kind of a teal all the way up to an orangish yellow, and you can see it applied through the surface right there. So you can do all kinds of cool things with ramp shaders. Uh, so that's added. Next, we also have a diffuse tune shader that's been added in OSL. So now you can get that. So it's a diffuse tune. Uh, it gives you a, a size option and a smooth option in this case that you can then adjust. So, you know, you can take this up to make it softer or take it down to make it harder, you know, let's say 0.01 or something like that. And then of course you can smooth it out as well. Uh, and then we also have a specular tune. The specular tune in this case looks like this. And by the way, these shaders, since I already mentioned that I don't know how to script in OSL, although I'm hoping to learn sometime soon, uh, these are example ones that are included in the test suite of files in the library directory of the SVN repository for Blender. And so I just got those from there. And so here we have the specular, uh, specular tune, which is basically the same thing as this, except that it's a specular shader. And so again, you've got your color, you've got your size and your smooth, uh, you know, which again are all defined within your code. So that you, then you can access the, the specular tune BSDFs or the, the diffuse tune or the diffuse ramp within OSL if you're doing OSL shaders. Uh, moving on, we also have multiple important sampling for lamps now. And multiple important sampling is really, really important. Because what it does is basically on our lamps here, we have this option for multiple important sampling. And basically in short, as far as users are concerned, as your lamps get larger and larger on this size here, it helps make the lamps less and less noisy on reflective surfaces. So if we just go in here, we render this sample. You can see here, this clears up pretty quickly. I've got three lamps here, uh, one red, one green, one blue. And the, the green one has a size of one. The other two have a size of two. And they're all using multiple important sampling. And it looks pretty good. You know, there's no fireflies or, any, or anything. And it's just kind of nice. But if I turn off multiple important sampling, you'll notice that it just immediately is really, really noisy and takes far more samples in order to clear up. So the multiple important sampling is basically just an option. I can't, again, I can't tell you how it works or why it works. But basically, it just reduces the noise for area lamps. Um, for sharp, glossy materials. Um, or, re yeah, for the regular lamp. I don't know if this is just for area lamps. In this case, this is a point lamp and it's working just fine. So I believe it's on all lamps. Uh, it does come at the cost of accuracy, where technically, if you leave this off and just let it render longer, you're going to have slightly more accurate highlights and lighting, but you're going to have to render again much longer. So, with a slight sacrifice of of physical accuracy, you can get much less noisy renders. And this is supported on lamps now. We previously had it on our world settings, underneath settings for multiple important sampling, and now we've got it for lamps. So, so that's a, a very, very nice improvement. Next, we also have 
let's just say select this object, a really big feature that we've been wanting for a long time is material preview. So we can see material preview right here, just like we used to have on the Blender internal engine. And so if we go in here, we've got our node editor like this, and I can just, you know, I can adjust the shaders here or I can adjust them here. Just go in, we'll adjust the color. We can see in just a moment, it'll give us a nice preview using a little preview scene of exactly how that's gonna look. Take the roughness say to 0.9. It immediately applies and looks good. And this will show textures. This will show um, procedural textures. Basically anything within your shader will be applied to this because technically what this actually is, is actually a little cycle scene that then is just rendering through the preview here. And so it works very, very nicely. We can also change the shape. We can go from a cube, a monkey, a sphere, or if you're doing hair, we've also got hair strand preview, just like we had in Blender 2.0 uh, or in the Blender internal engine. So this is a very, very welcome feature for cycles because you know this is going to show you a preview much quicker than if you're rendering like a really complex scene. You know, On a very simple scene like this, it doesn't really make any sense because I can just render this really, really quickly and I'm good to go. But if you're working on a really complex scene, then that's a whole nother story. Uh, now just be aware that if you have this open, it's going to be rendering in the background. And so if you're previewing in the viewport, you probably want to go ahead and close this tab such that it's not rendering both of them and just slowing you down. And then the last thing that we have for cycles is tiles rendering, which was already added in Blender, but now we've got a couple improvements to tiles rendering. So in the performance tab, we now have an, here in the options, we can now set the direction or the tile order. So when we render, Blender or Cycles by default renders in tiles. So if I render this, you can see it's rendering in tiles and we now have highlighting to show you which tile is rendering based on the little orange boxes and we have the direction of the tiles. So right now it's set to render out from the center, but if I just say cancel this and say render from left to right, render it's going to start at the left and then just move to the right. And so this just allows you to set this kind of on your personal preference or like, let's say, you know, you, the most important part of your image is here in the center. You might want to render from the center or maybe you want to render from top to bottom or bottom to top. So it's just a little bit more uh, customization to allow you to render and get, you know, faster access to just what you need to see within cycles.